this is the best description in the National Portrait Gallery. If you've been to the National Portrait Gallery, it's a great, um, it's a great gallery. It contains lots of portraits, and it belongs to the nation, hence the name National Portrait Gallery. Um, <laughs> basically, a load of dead people that people have painted. So you get a little pack, a caption next to them, right? It tells you what, what the dead person did. Here's one. George Villiers, second Duke of Buckingham. The son of James I's favorite, Buckingham fought for the royalist side during the civil wars and was exiled, but he later returned to England and married the daughter of the parliamentarian General Fairfax in the hope of regaining his lands. At the restoration, he was favored by Charles II, helped to engineer the downfall of Clarendon and became a member of the cabal. Famous for his intrigues and immorality, he seduced the Countess of Shrewsbury and killed her husband in a duel in 1668. Described as, quote, one of the worst men alive, end quote, he was eventually dismissed from office in 1674. He wrote a number of witty satirical comedies. Now, after the Facebook post, I reflected on why my friend found that funny. Um, because it is just a series of facts about a real person's life. Um, and I thought about Daniel Dennett, um, who has a, a theory about what makes things funny. He describes it as the joy of debugging. Um, so he says that when you finally see something for kind of what it really is, and the facts lay themselves out for you properly, um, that there's a kind of a humor in that, there's a joy in that, that the concept has been debugged. Um, and that statement of that man's life is just an honest statement of facts. It debugs, and so it's funny. And I hope that as we look at this uh, passage, this parable today, uh, that our view of the kingdom of God will be debugged and that we'll feel that joy and that it will stick with us and we'll take that away out into the world. So let's look into the text and see how Jesus debugs the idea of the kingdom of God. Now, I'm going to do some context. I'm going to set up some context that comes before the passage that we've had read to us. Don't turn it up. Um, or do turn it up if you want, but if you prefer, just take me uh, at my word. So, in chapter 13, verse 10, we find out that shortly before uh, this passage, Jesus has at least once performed a healing miracle on the Sabbath. And the Sabbath, as you know, is the day of rest, according to the law, when, no, um, when it was thought that no work should be done. Now, back in our chapter, in chapter 14, uh, verse 1, it's the Sabbath again on this day uh, when we're hearing this parable. Also, verse 1, Jesus has gone to the house of a prominent Pharisee. Now, Pharisees, if you don't know, are an important group of people. Um, they're well known for their strict observance of and knowledge about the law, and they're particularly known, uh, this is particularly relevant for this passage, um, they have a very strict view of what can and can, cannot be done on the Sabbath day. So no work can be done on the Sabbath day at all, and that includes healing. Verse 2, one of the people um, who is present listening to this parable is a man who is suffering from abnormal swelling of his body. And verse 3, the Pharisees have just asked Jesus whether it's okay to do healing work on the Sabbath. And remember, today is the Sabbath in the story. I mean... Now as well, but in the story. Jesus has already healed on the Sabbath, and it is the Sabbath again, and there's an ill man in front of him. So what's going on? Well, Jesus has been invited to a situation where he's being set up to fail. Right? Either he's going to do the healing on the Sabbath and outrage the Pharisees, or he's not going to do the healing, uh, and so he's going to backtrack from his earlier position of doing healings on the Sabbath. So... In the words of Admiral Akbar, it's a trap. Not too many Star Wars fans in the room today. Uh, now, last week we heard something about what Jesus does, first of all, to respond to being put in that position, and he starts telling parables. And in a short time, uh, Jesus has already used those parables to unmask some of the hypocrisy um, of the Pharisees. And if you want to hear more about how Jesus starts doing that, then have a look at Tom Woodbridge's sermon from last week. But where we pick up the trail here in verse 15, the atmosphere is now very, very tense. So as I've said, Jesus has already unmasked some of the hypocrisy. Um, and so you can imagine that his hosts will have been feeling very uncomfortable. It's a bit like if you went uh, to dinner at number 10 Downing Street, and there's the Prime Minister and his aides and ministers. 
Um, and he asks you some particularly tricky question designed to, designed to catch you out about Brexit. And you, quick as a flash, come back with a zinger. And he's embarrassed, and his aides are embarrassed, and his ministers are embarrassed. And everybody feels the air get a little bit thicker. That's kind of what's going on here. That's the atmosphere in the room where we pick up. The topic is really emotive. The power dynamics are crackling, and the mood is very tense. It's important to understand that tense mood, because where we start at verse 15, somebody tries to smooth over that tense atmosphere. So what does the guest say? Well, a lot of what, we, uh, uh, what a lot of us would do in that situation, we say something that everybody can agree with, right? So if you're having a tough conversation about Brexit, well, what you say is, oh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we all just want to see the country do well so much, right? Because we can all agree on that. So, yeah, very good, very good. So in our passage, the guy, the guy says, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. And the point is it's supposed to be harmless, right? On one level, all he's saying is, wouldn't it be great to be at a feast in paradise with God? Yeah, great, well done, fine. Everybody agrees with that, right? But Jesus doesn't let him get away with that tactic. He latches on to one of the phrases that our guest uses, which is the kingdom of God. Now, to understand why that's important, we need a brief uh, pause for a history lesson. The kingdom of God is a phrase that's used by the Pharisees in a specific context. King David was an ancient king of Israel, long dead uh, by this point. Um, his descendants were no longer on the throne. He was, a, he was, he was, he was an old king whose the line had, um, had, had passed out of power because power had passed to the Romans who were um, an, essentially an invading, occupying force. Now, David's line is important because the people of Israel thought of, of David's time as king as being the time when their country flourished the most. It was the best time for their country. So the Pharisees used to use the phrase the kingdom of God to describe a time when they thought King David's descendants would retake the kingdom um, from the Romans and restore what they saw as being proper national government. And importantly, they thought that the way that they could make this happen was by living pure lives in accordance with the very fine detail of their interpretation of the law. Now, Jesus is about to upend that assumption and give a completely different, debugged account of what the kingdom of God is. So, to understand the conversational uh, dynamics, it's a bit like when I said earlier, somebody says, um, well, I'm so glad we all want to see the country do well. I mean, really, the answer to that is, isn't it? It depends what you mean by do well, right? Jesus does the same thing here. The guest says, oh, it'll be a great thing to be in the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, well, maybe, but the question is what you mean by the kingdom of God. So, Princess Bride, Inigo Montoya, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. So how does Jesus debug our understanding of the kingdom of God? Well, I want to see... I want us to see four things. The image that he uses to describe it, how people respond, what God does next, and what the point of it all is. So we start with the image that's used to describe it. Here's part of verse 16. A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. Now, before we go any further, it's important to see that the great banquet is not the thing that the, uh, the person who tried to smooth everything over was talking about, okay? So the guy who's, talk, who's trying to smooth everything over um, says, blessed is the one who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God, but in Greek he just says, the person who will, um, who will fagain artons, who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Jesus uses a new image, and he talks about a date non mega a big banquet. So it's a new phrase that Jesus has introduced, a new image that Jesus has, uh, has conjured up to describe the kingdom of God. Um, why is it important that he selects that image? Well, I think it's because it's so domestic and so joyful. 
So the kingdom of God is easy to think of as, uh, in other ways, so it's easy to think of it as a great courtroom of justice, or a great battlefield where good will defeat evil, or a great city where everything is in order and people live happy lives. And there is some benefit in thinking about the kingdom of God in these ways. They're not necessarily wrong, but it isn't the image that Jesus picks here because it's not what the Pharisees need to hear. They were really interested in rules and laws and order. Um, And as I've said, they thought that bringing in the kingdom of God was a political exercise involving standards of civic behavior and ultimately change of leadership at the top. So they probably would have, I I would guess, like ideas like the great courtroom or the great battlefield or the great city. But Jesus defeats those expectations and he says, it's like a big party at somebody's house. And now before we think that our expectations aren't like those of the Pharisees, so that this is not particularly important for us, let me challenge that. Uh, But particularly by reference to things like online behavior, let's think of um, Twitter mobs calling somebody out for having the wrong opinions, or the, the horrendous things that are sometimes written below the line under a news article. The people who write those tweets and those comments have a very clear idea of what needs to happen for the world to be made a better place. And they then take it upon themselves to act as a kind of social police to condemn people who step out of line. Now, there's a good part of that, which is that these people have ideas of goodness and purity that they're committed to. The trouble is that there are some other values, like forgiveness, charity, relationship, that aren't so high on the agenda. So do you see how those Twitter mobsters are sort of similar to the Pharisees? Both groups only function because uh, they're confident that they've figured out what they need to do to make the world a better place. And the Pharisees did this through a very intimate study of the law, and keyboard warriors do it by spending 30 seconds on Wikipedia. So the methods are different, but the end project is the same. They place absolute confidence in their ideas of what's good, fair, or right, And then from that position of confidence, they can look down on people who don't meet their standards. And for those people, the idea that the kingdom of God is a great banquet is really important because it says that the world being a better place is maybe a bit less about imposing order and rigor and strictness and a bit more about relationship, community, and friendship. Maybe the kingdom of God is less about making sure that people do what you think is right and more about coming to a banquet with them, breaking bread with them, joining hands with them. And please, that's not a platitude. That's actually really hard. That's a really hard thing for us as human beings to do because I think we all like rules because they're easy and they can be applied and they can be used to divide people and cut them up and put them in boxes compliant, non-compliant. We don't like difficult, complex, messy human interactions. But getting to grips with those interactions is vital because that's how we defeat some of the, the, the worst human instincts. Some of you may be familiar with Charlie Chaplin, who's a brilliant filmmaker. He's um, often known for his physical comedy and some old black and white movies. Uh, If you don't know him, you might recognize him if I showed you a picture. Um, He inhabits a character called the Tramp with the big oversized shoes and the mustache and the battered uh, tailcoat and hat. Um, But he also made some really political films with great dialogue. And one of his most famous is um, is a film called The Great Dictator, Uh, where he plays two people. He plays a Jewish uh, barber, and he plays a um, a dictator as well with the name Abnoid Hinkle, so you can guess uh, who he's satirizing in this film, given that it's made in 1940. And because the two characters, they look the same, right? they're both played by Chaplin, so they're supposed to be doppelgangers, Um, it's a classic comedy about um, confused identity. So the barber gets mixed up with the dictator, and the, and the barber then gets thrust out onto a stage in front of the military parade um, and is asked to address the troops um, in the way that Hinkle was supposed to. Um, and the barber seizes the initiative and says, it's time for me to deliver uh, the message that I think these guys need to hear. Um, 
You should watch the whole thing, because it's quite moving, um, particularly with Charlie Chaplin's inimitable delivery. But he's, a little bit of what he says is this. Soldiers, don't give yourselves to brutes, men who despise you, enslave you, who regiment your lives, tell you what to do, what to think, and what to feel, who drill you, diet you, treat you like cattle, use you as cannon fodder. Don't give yourselves to these unnatural men, machine men, with machine minds and machine hearts. You are not machines, you are not cattle, you are men. You have the love of humanity in your hearts. You don't hate, only the unloved hate, the unloved and the unnatural. Soldiers, don't fight for slavery, fight for liberty. In the 17th chapter of St. Luke, it is written, the kingdom of God is within man. Not one man or a group of men, but in all men, in you. You, the people, have the power, the power to create machines, the power to create happiness. You, the people, have the power to make this life free and beautiful, to make this life a wonderful adventure. Then, in the name of democracy, let us use that power. Let us all unite. Let us fight for a new world, a decent world, that will give men a chance to work, that will give youth a future and old age a security. By the promise of these things, brutes have risen to power, but they lie. They do not fulfill that promise. They never will. Dictators free themselves, but they enslave the people. Now let us fight to fulfill that promise. Let us fight to free the world, to do away with national barriers, to do away with greed, with hate and intolerance. So do you hear the barber's message? Perhaps not totally theologically aligned with the parable that we have here, but some echoes. The kingdom of God is in your midst, in the joining of hands, in the breaking of bread, the tearing down of barriers. The kingdom of God is in the coming together at the great banquet. So that's the image that Jesus uses to describe the kingdom of God. Now let's look at how people respond. So I think a, uh, a lot of people might think that what I've said um, so far is kind of easy to agree with in the way that it's quite nicey-nicey. You, uh, uh, you can all agree that being being loving and, and being united is a good thing. But let's look at what Jesus says people say when they hear that message. I'm um, at verse 18. They all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I have just bought a field, I must go and see it, please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out, please excuse me. And still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. Now notice how these excuses are extremely poor. So the first person has said that uh, he's just bought a field, uh, so has to go and see it. Now, uh, I don't know what you think, but I don't think that even makes sense. I mean, presumably he looked at the field before he bought it. It's not as if he could have looked on right move uh, 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 2,000 years ago. He's presumably gone to inspect it. So what's he going to do? Go to the field and say, yes, this is certainly my field. It hasn't moved since I last saw it. Um, the second one with the oxen, I mean... Okay, he's bought some oxen, that's all very good. They're not going to freeze up or fall over if he doesn't use them to go plowing immediately. And the third, the third person doesn't even try. Just says, oh, I've got married, so I can't come. To which the answer is, and? So you don't eat dinner anymore? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. And we can laugh, and in a way should laugh, at the absurdity of the excuses, but it's important as well to realize that they're actually very true to life. So the first person talks about land, that's wealth. The second person talks about um, oxen farming in an agricultural economy, that's work. And the third person talks about uh, marriage, and that, particularly at, at that time, that's status and sex. And isn't it true that when we hear a radical call, to turn away from the world and be in community and to be in relationship in the kingdom of God, we make those excuses as well. We hear the call. Well, maybe, but I'll buy my big house first and then I'll come spend time with you and money on our church. We hear the call. No, I can't make it this week because I can miss our book group, I can miss our small group, but I can't miss my sales target. We hear the call. Mm, that doesn't sound very prestigious. It doesn't sound very sexy. I'd rather something else. Thanks very much. Now, what's interesting is that all of those excuses are um, capable of being really good things. Um, providing for yourself 
uh, is a good thing, and hard work is a good thing, and sex is a good thing. But some good things, and these are three um, of the main culprits, can be misused, and they can, be, uh, and they can become destructive um, if they are mishandled. And I think it might be part of it is because they're kind of bottomless. You can always have more of them. You can keep filling up the jug, and it never reaches the brim. And then there might be some extreme cases where you think that that doesn't apply. But I think, actually, for most people, or perhaps even for everybody, that does apply. Uh, it's a bit like the, the, um, the Curse of the Black Pearl, if you uh, remember Pirates of the Caribbean. Uh, Captain Barbosa uh, says, uh, when he's explaining the curse to uh, Miss Turner, says this, there be the chest, inside be the gold. I mean, I'll, if you, if, you, if you allow me, I'll take the accent out now, because it could get boring for you. And we took them all. We spent them and traded them and frittered them away on drink and food and pleasurable company. But the more we gave them away, the more we came to realize the drink would not satisfy, the food turned to ash in our mouths, and all the pleasurable company in the world could not slake our lust. We are cursed men, Miss Turner. We are all cursed in the way that Captain Barbosa describes. We bring the curse on ourselves by turning from the kingdom of God, by turning from the banquet, by turning from each other, and looking to our needs and desires first. But as for the crew of the Black Pearl, so for us, that will not satisfy. So those are the excuses. Let's look third at what God does next. How does the host respond when the excuses come flooding in? Well, here's verse 21. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets of the alleys in the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. So what does the host do when people reject him? Well, the first thing that happens is that he becomes angry, and it's easy to miss that, but it's important. When we reject the kingdom of God, when we reject each other, uh, when we are invited to join in, but turn away to our own path, we commit a real wrong. So God becomes angry. But that anger doesn't last for long, because almost immediately the servant goes out into, into the town. The doors of the house are flung open, and in come the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And that is interesting, isn't it? That the people who end up coming to the banquet are those who outside it had the least of all. And why is that? Well, let's reflect. They didn't have fields or oxen or wives. Uh, they were the have-nots. And that, that can seem like a bad thing. They had a, they had a bad lot in life. Um, but the have-nots are lucky to not have at least one thing, and that is an excuse. They don't have an excuse to turn away from the kingdom of God because they know firsthand that life is fleeting and rough and unfair. Uh, they know that the kingdom of me can be an ugly place. And that makes them more likely to think that the kingdom of God is probably a good idea. So if you do well out of the kingdom of me, if it brings you money and power and sex or any other number of gifts, then why would you want to leave? But if what you see in the kingdom of me is distrust, and isolation and darkness, then of course you'll be prepared to leave it behind. So what can we do if we are, and many of the people in this room are, people who do reasonably well out of the kingdom of me? We don't have life so bad. Well, perhaps I can suggest that we should try to see that it's fleeting, see that it's thin and easily punctured, see through the eyes of the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame, and see that whatever we think we have, it's no excuse not to desire the kingdom of God. That's what Jesus says in Matthew 6, 33. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. And everything else follows after that. So finally, uh, the fourth point, what is the point of it all? Look what happens in verses 22 and 23. The poor have come into the banquet, but there is still room. So what does the host do? He gets more people. More. He wants more. 
so that my house will be full, he says. The nature of the kingdom of God is such that it is supposed to be full. Everyone is welcome. It's meant to have as many people as possible in it. The function of the kingdom of God is for the house of God to be full to the rafters. The point of the kingdom of God is for everyone to be invited. Isn't that wonderful? But, hear the warning in verse 24, those people who made the excuses were invited, but in the end they never made it. So now, as I close, let's try turning the parable on ourselves. Are we like the Pharisees? Do we like the idea of the kingdom of God, but wrap it up in humanity? And when we realize that the kingdom of God means coming together with him and her and her around one table under God, do we turn our noses up? Do we prefer the riches that the world has to offer? Or do we answer the call and commit to each other under God? It's clear which one I'm advocating, but what does that really look like? Well, two ideas for us. They are radical humility and radical inclusion. So remember what I said about the Pharisees and the Twitter mobsters. They placed absolute confidence in their own ideas, and then they looked down from their position of confidence at people who weren't meeting their standards. Now, I describe that in negative terms, but please don't understand me to say that there's no room to condemn what you genuinely think to be wrong but we have to do it from the right position if we're Christians. If we are all invited to the banquet and none of us is the host, if we are all equally undeserving and none of us has a right to be there, if we are all beneficiaries of generosity from the host, from God, then we won't place confidence in our ideas and look down on those who don't comply. We'll place confidence in God's grace and look across at our fellow humans as peers, equal in wrongdoing and equal in dignity, so we won't spend our energy creating rules of spirituality or complaining about the way that other people are acting. We'll spend our energy understanding each other, connecting with each other, and being with each other. Look around you, in this church, in your family, in your community, on your commute to work. Those people you see, they could be invited to the banquet. Do you see that? Do you see that they are all like you, like me, like us? They are under grace. Well, if you do, you will naturally want to include them in your life and in your church. It will mean that no one is too rude or too different to be invited into this building. It will mean that no one is too boring or too antisocial or too disruptive to be invited into your home. It will mean that we treat everyone and I do mean everyone with the dignity that befits a being made in the image of God and with the humility that befits poor creatures like us who are invited so spectacularly and unexpectedly to the great banquet that is the kingdom of God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that your kingdom is a great banquet. Um, and we thank you for your generosity in throwing open the doors to um, those who could never have expected to be invited in. We pray, Father, that as we take communion together, we would um, see that as a foretaste, as a picture of the great banquet that is to come. Um, and taste of the joy that it means to come together under you. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.